My name is Ian McCormick. I'm born in New Zealand, 32 years old, and I'd like to share with you just how um, the Lord touched my life, and it's almost seven years ago now, so I'd like to just share with you how God has changed my life and how the Lord Jesus Christ became real to me through personal experience and encounter with God and with eternity. So I'd just like to read a few scriptures before I start. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. I'd like to turn to another scripture. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Another scripture too, if we just turn to John chapter 10, John chapter 10 and verses, um, verse 6, I'll actually read verse 9, I am the door and if anyone enters through me he shall be saved, he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And turn to another scripture also in John. Um, John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I'd like to finish off with just one other scripture. It's in, um, it's in John chapter 9 verse 5. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. I was raised in New Zealand... My parents um, were teachers, and as a young man, I travelled around many many parts of New Zealand. I was educated in um, in Lincoln University, finished a degree in agriculture down there, and worked for two years as a farm consultant in New Zealand Dairy Board, based out of Newstead in Hamilton. I was um, I loved farming and enjoyed the farm life. I was a real outdoor person and loved going out on the weekends and diving, surfing, tramping, all kinds of sports. I just really loved it and enjoyed outdoor living. Enjoyed working with on farms and working with nature. Um, when I was in early nineteen not early nineteen eighty, my best friend and I decided to travel overseas and we did a bit of a, a trip overseas. We, we decided that we would we'd go for maybe one or two years. We were quite, quite adventurous at heart. So my friend was in the forestry in um, Rotorua, in the FRI. We left New Zealand and went across to Australia and hitched from Sydney up to Brisbane and across to Darwin um, and then into Bali. We went right through Indonesia, Java, Singapore, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka. And it's amazing, as we traveled through Asia, we were continually questioned and asked by the people, are you Christian? And no, I, was quite, I was quite taken back because I was brought up in a Christian family, Christian home. I was raised an Anglican. At the age of 14, I was confirmed in the church. And yet I can remember back when I was 14 in the church how at communion, I'd never really sensed any presence of God, and you know, I used to pray as a child and go to Sunday school and the youth group and to all the, I was in the choir and stuff, and yet I'd never really developed or had an experience with God, a personal experience with Him. And I remember coming out of the church that day at the day of confirmation, 
after taking communion for the first time in the church and I was quite disillusioned. I was quite taken back and thought, well, nothing seemed to happen. And I went out and I remember asking my mother, does, you know, does God speak? I pray every day. Does he really speak? Have you ever heard God speak to you? And my mother had turned to me and she said, well, God does speak and um, he is real. And, and I said, well, when did you hear him? And she had shared how she had cried out at a time of tragedy and, um, and the Lord had met her and, and, and she had had a personal relationship with him. And, and I said, well, I haven't had any tragedy and I don't, things seem to be okay in my life. How come it is I don't seem to hear God? And my mother said, well, often it takes a tragedy to humble us. Men by nature tend to be quite proud. <laughs> and I went, well, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not proud. But um, and I reflected and I was very, really proud. And, and my mother said, look, Ian, I'm not going to force you to come to church. But remember this one thing, whatever you do in life, wherever you go, no matter how far you think you've gone away from God, remember this one thing, if nothing else. That if you're in trouble and, and in need, cry out to God from your heart. Cry out to God from your heart and He will hear you. He will really hear you and forgive you. He will really hear you and forgive you. And I remember those words and they stuck in my mind and so I found that rather than be a hypocrite, I wouldn't go back to church because I never really had an experience with God. And it was basically just religion to me. And so, as I went through Asia, people used to ask me, are you a Christian, Ian? And I had to really think, because I wasn't really a Christian, because I didn't really believe in God. I knew about Him, but didn't really believe in Him. And I was quite, um, I was quite confronted by the reality of their faith and their different beliefs. Yet what shocked me was seeing them bow down and worship idols, because I could see that they'd been made with their human hands. And so, deep in my heart, I was going, well, why? Why do men bow down to things that they've actually made with their own hands? It was quite confusing to me. To hang on to a little bit I remembered in the Old Testament about the Ten Commandments, that thou shalt have no other God than me, thou shalt not bow down to any graven image or worship any idol. Anyhow, I travelled, I surfed, I dived, um, went into jungles, um, went into Sri Lanka, amazing nation and I was able to get on a huge schooner, a 96 foot yacht and sail down to Mauritius, a small island in the Indian Ocean. It took us 26 days. I arrived there and for a num well, almost two months I lived there and lived with the local Creoles, the black divers there. They taught me how to dive during the day on the reef and also to dive at night. I ran out of money and um, the people in um, well, the people that were there said, well, South Africa's a good place. You can earn quite a bit of money. And so I went across to South Africa for, I think it was nearly eight, eight or ten months. And my brother wrote to me while I was in South Africa and said, please come back to my wedding in New Zealand. And I hummed and hard, tossed it up. I must return to New Zealand for my brother's wedding. So I got on a plane from Durban and flew back to Mauritius. And this is basically where my story begins. I had a few more days, I think it was about a, a week before I was about to leave. And um, they came to me one night and said, Ian, let's go, go, let's go night diving again. So I walked out like I normally do, out onto my veranda, looked out to see the, the ocean and the weather, and I saw a huge electrical storm out at sea. And lots of bolts of lightning, and I turned to my friend Simon, who's the black guy, and said, you know, are you sure? Have you seen the storm? And he said, oh, it's, it's cool, don't worry. It's going to miss us. It'll miss us. Because I was afraid that it might bring too much surf up onto the reef. It might get too dangerous. And um, he said, it'll be okay. We're going f about five miles down the coast to a very, very beautiful part of the reef to dive tonight. You'll be really amazed how beautiful it is, this coral reef. Come down with us. So I hummed and hard, and in the end, he talked talk me into it. So I got all my gear, it's about 11 at night, got all my gear, jumped in the boat, and off we went. And we just row it, we just row down. Rowed all the way down the coast, and we're about half a mile off the actual island. We've got the inner lagoon, and we're diving on the outer part of the, the reef, where it just drops straight away, very, very steeply. And we dived in. I went up the reef, and my two friends actually went down the reef this particular night. Normally we stick together, but we got separated. I went up the reef, and I just was going, going and looking for a crayfish, and I saw something in the water, 
they look like a squid. And I went up, and I actually went out and grabbed it. I had my gloves on, and it squeezed through my fingers like a jellyfish. And I, I looked at it, it was just kind of float away. Now, that's a weird-looking jellyfish. Very, very weird. <laughs> like an octop uh, squid's head, but then box-shaped. And the tentacles, very unusual, finger-like tentacles. It was an unusual-looking jellyfish, trans fairly transparent. And in my mind, I went, that's something, that's, I've never seen that type of jellyfish before. But anyhow, I just ignored it and kept going. And as I was diving along, something stung me. I wasn't looking, and something stung my arm. My wetsuit came to here, so the only part of my body that wasn't covered by a wetsuit were the forearms. And something brushed past me and stung me. Incredible shock. It was like standing over in the cow shed with uh, wet concrete, <laughs> gumboots off, bare feet, standing on the concrete and walking up to the mains unit and resting your hand right up against the mains and just holding it there. <sighs> oh, I've never been hit. I've been so many electrical shocks on electric fences I forget about it. I can just about hold the things. But this was such a shock that it just about knocked me in the water. And I recoiled from it and with my flashlight underwater flashlight try to find out where it was or what it was. I couldn't see what had hit me. So I looked down at my arm to see if there was any blood or what it was. Something had bitten me or whether I'd cut myself on the reef, hit the reef, but there's nothing. All it was was just throbbing. And so I rubbed it, which of course turned out to be one of the worst things you could do. And I rubbed it to try and see something under the water. Nothing. By now, it seemed like it was, wasn't so bad. The pain seemed to be just numbing out a bit. And so I, I left it and thought, well, I'll get a crayfish and I'll go back and ask the, the boys at the boat what it was. I don't want to get paranoid. <laughs> when a diver, you should never get, you know, get really upset. So I got a crayfish, and as I was diving down to get a crayfish, I saw these same jellyfish that I'd seen a few minutes ago, two of them coming towards me, just slowly pulsating towards me. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw their tentacles brush past my arm. And as they touched it, the same electrical current and shock went through my arm. And it just about knocked me for a six in the water. And I suddenly realized what it was that had hit me. And I know from my life-saving experience, and I was a surf lifesaver, that jellyfish, some certain jellyfish are incredibly poisonous. And I thought, I've just been stung by something that's got an incredible sting in it. I've never been hit with such a powerful sting. And as a child, I used to have hay fever. You know, I never have hay fever or allergies. <laughs> I used to have allergies such that if I got a bee bite, my, arm, my leg would just swell up like a balloon. So I was very, very allergic to any kind of a sting. And so I was pretty worried. I'd now had two separate stings from these jellyfish. And I swam to the surface, lifted my head to try and look for the boat. And it was, I could kind of make it out a bit down, a bit down the reef. And it was a bit of cloud from the storm. And so I lifted my head and swam across the surface. I put my arm behind my back to try and get it from out of the water <laughs> so I wouldn't be stung anymore. And as I was swimming along like that, I felt something go over my back again and sting me again. And I went, oh, no. And sure enough, I sh the tentacles falling off. I'd been stung by a third one. And I, by this time, I, I grabbed both hands like this. And I put my head back into the water. And I went, mean, I wonder where I am, just to keep an eye on the reef. And I lifted my flashlight back down to where the reef should be. And to my horror, my flashlight beam just went straight down. And beneath me, 20, 20 feet beneath me, were hundreds, most likely thousands, of these jellyfish. It was like a, a soup or a... If you're over the East Coast during, the, during summer, anyone swimming and see all the jellyfish in the water? We had quite a few this year, didn't we? Well, that's what it was. Right underneath me was just thousands of them. And as I lifted my flashlight up, I could see them all around my face. You know, just I started to pick them up, how close they were to me. 
And I thought, if one of these hits my face, I don't think I'll ever get back to the boat. So I put the flashlight really close up to my face and swam. Got back to the boat and asked the young boy there in my best French and Creole, which is the language that they speak, what was in the water that was so dangerous. And the young boy didn't know because he wasn't a diver. He just <laughs> shook his head and he pointed to the diver, Simon, the guy who was the experienced diver. And so I saw him, got back, back into the water because I just hung on the side of the boat and talked to him and then swam over to him. I could see him underwater, so I flashed my light into his face to get his attention and to go up. So he came up to the surface and I told him, I want to get out. I want to get out and, and talk to him. And he goes, right. So I put my head back down into the water and to my horror, here's a jellyfish right next to my face, just surging back towards me. And I just had to, ch had to choose, does it hit my face or do I just take it on my arm? So I lifted my arm up and another sting onto my arm. So I pushed that jellyfish out and I'm, <laughs> this poor arm has had so many stings that I get out onto the reef and the reef is maybe about two foot covering the actual reef, the outer reef. So I stood there in my flippers and looked. My arm was literally swollen like a balloon and across the top of the skin were like heat blisters, like burn blisters, as though you'd burnt them on the stove, right across where the tentacles had been dragged. And I was looking at it as the, my friend Simon, the black diver, was walking across the reef in his flippers towards me, wondering what on earth has got me so freaked out. And he looks at my, looks at my arm and then he looks at me and he goes, how many, you know, kiss affair, kiss affair, what's happening? Um, how many, tuck? And I went, four, I think, <laughs> four, you know, katra, katra, tuck. And he went, invisible, which is sur la plage, is invisible. I said, yeah, it looks invisible. <laughs> and he went, he went, actually gave a French swear word, but he said, one, c'est fini, one. Un, un, tuck. Stephanie, for you. <laughs> I went, what? <laughs> and he put his flashlight up on his face, and I could see the seriousness. One, Stephanie. And I went, <laughs> well, what am I doing with four of them on my arm then? And he was panicking himself, and I was panicking, because he'd been diving for 20 plus years, <laughs> and he lives there. And, and he, and he, I, he basically motioned, you've got to go to the hospital. He said, allez, allez, vitement, quatre bon, which is the main hospital. But that was 15, almost 20, 15, 18 miles away, the middle of the night, and I'm half a mile off the reef. So I'm hearing him say go, and I'm just almost paralyzed standing there, and he's trying to get me into the water, back into the water to get into the boat. So he lowers me back into the water, and helps me over towards the boat and as they're dragging me in I realize that my arm is paralyzed I can't lift it so it's just dragging in the water and as they're dragging me into the into the boat I hit with another one and I went in my heart I went what have I done to deserve this then I got a flash of my sin I knew suddenly what I'd done wrong it's like payback you ever know the feeling you don't get away with nothing. So I basically almost like got a flash of what I'd done wrong and went, well, perhaps that's why I've got this. Put me into the boat and they lifted it over the coral reef. They lifted it up and lifted the whole boat over the reef and it was ripping the bottom. It was a wooden boat and this is their livelihood. So for them to do it, I knew that it was very, very serious. They lifted the boat over into the lagoon and took off. And they were swimming, trying to push the boat to get it going. And I said, come with me. They said, no, too much, it's too heavy. Only pole. Get the young boy to take you ashore. So this young kid is just pushing and racing. And I'm, I'm finding it very difficult to breathe in my right lung. I could feel the poison go through my bloodstream and punch something under my arm, like a lymph gland being hit. Then my right lung was going... 
with my wetsuit, it was being constricted. And so I undid my wetsuit with my left arm, peeled it off, put, and put on, my, put on my pants while I could still move, and then sat there and just dripping with perspiration, just pouring off me. And I'm getting very dry in the mouth so quickly, and I could feel the poison moving. And it's like someone had hit me in the kidneys, because I feel a sharp pain hit me in the back here. And I went, this poison is moving real quick. And I'm trying not to move, trying not to panic. And the poison, as I'm halfway to shore, I can feel it literally going down. I could feel it pulsating and moving through my blood system. I didn't know which way my blood went until that night. But I tell you what, I got real interested which way my blood circulated. Because I could feel poison going down here, numbing out my whole of my right And I had enough common sense <laughs> to know that if it got down that leg and back up to this, this my heart or my brain, then I'm not going to be there anymore. Because the amount of poison was just paralyzing me. And as I was coming to shore, I could literally, st I started to blur a little bit in my eyes. I was starting to find it difficult to focus. And we hit the shore. And the boy said, you know, come, he's going to get out of here. And so I stood up to go to get out, and my right leg just crumbled underneath me. And I fell right into the crayfish, right onto the whole lot, <laughs> right into the bottom of the boat. And the young boy stood back a bit shocked, and then he motioned for me to put my arm around his neck. And so I put my arm around his neck and grabbed this arm that was paralyzed and just held on. And he dragged me, just dragged me out of the boat. And then up the beach, which is pretty hard on coral sand, he got me up onto the main road. But it's, it must be nearly 11 o'clock, no, 12 o'clock at night by this stage. And it's a small island. It's like being out at Nuta Nui trying to get into Te <laughs> You know, there's, no, there's nothing happening out there. There's no cars. There's no nothing. And so I'm holding on to this young boy, wondering how on earth I am going to get from there to the hospital such a late time of the night and I was so so weak in this leg that I actually sat down on the road and the young boy tried to help me and in the end he started pointing to his to this ocean again saying my brothers my brothers are out there I need to go out there and get them and I said no you need to stay here and help me and in the end he just took off and as I sat there I felt incredibly tired and began to lie down on the road as I lay down on the road, I just started staring up into the stars, and I thought, well, I'll go to sleep. And I was just about to close my eyes and just lie there on the middle of the road and go to sleep, which I thought was sleep, <laughs> and I heard a clear voice speak to me, say, Ian, if you close your eyes, you shall never awake again. And I fought, I shook off the sleepiness and thought, what am I doing? You, don't, you can't go to sleep here. You need to get to a hospital. You need to get antitoxins. You need to get help. You go to sleep here, you may, that's right, you may never wake up. And so I tried, to, I tried to stand again, and this leg was pretty weak, but I was able to hobble down the road, and I found a couple of cars there with some Indian drivers next to a restaurant, just about 100 metres down the road, which is, I never knew was there. And I went over to them and begged begged them to take me to the hospital. And the Indians looked at me and said, how much money you pay us? Well, if you've lived in Asia, you know that that's normal. That's not, that's not abnormal. That's normal. You have money, you, you go. You have no money, you go nowhere. And so I went, in my, in my mind, I went, I haven't got any money. Speaking out loud to myself, then I realized, you fool. <laughs> you should never have said that. Could have lied. But I didn't. I just told the truth. I have no money. And three of the three drivers just laughed. <laughs> you're drunk. You're crazy. Turned around and just lit a smoke and started to walk off. And I literally heard a clear voice say, Ian, are you willing to beg for your life? And I sure am. <laughs> and I even, I even know how to do it. I lived in Africa long enough. I've seen the black men cup their hands and bow their heads to the white man and go, yes, Mbasa, yes, Mbasa, yes, Mbasa. So I'd seen it. And I, it was very easy for me to get on my knees because this leg had already gone. And this leg was very wobbly. I was leaning up against the car. So I just slipped down onto my knees and I cupped my hands and I lowered my head not to look at them and just begged for my life. 
And I was nearly crying. Because I knew that if I didn't get to a hospital soon, I ain't going nowhere. And if these guys didn't have compassion and love in their heart for me and mercy towards me, I wasn't, I'd have died there right in front of them. And so I begged and pleaded with them for my life. And they, I could see their feet. With my head lowered, I could see their feet. Two of them just walked. But one young man, you could see his feet moving in indecision. And it seemed to go on for a long time. I was just pleading for my life. Then he came over and just picked me up. Didn't speak, just picked me up, helped me up, put me in the car and drove. And I'm going, I wish I'm going to get to the hospital. It was worth begging. Halfway to the hospital, he changes his mind. He says, where's my money? How, I said, I'll give you all the money I got. When your life's at stake, your money means nothing, believe me. I said, I'll give you any money you want. If you can get me to hospital, save my life, I'll give you it all, you know. But he, was, he, he knew that I was just talking. He wanted practice. Where was it coming from? And halfway to the hospital, he changed his mind and took me to a big tourist hotel and said, oh, I'll drop you here. But you just go and get some help there. Forget it. You know, no, I'm not going to take you. And so I said, no, look, please take me. I'm, I don't, I'm dying. Help. And, and he just leant over, undid my safety belt, opened the door, and said, get out. And I said, look, I can't get out. I don't think I can move. And so he said, well, get out. And he just shoved me out. And he just, my legs kind of caught there, just lifted them and chucked them out, slammed the door and drove off. And I literally lay there, and in my heart I said, this world stinks. I've seen death, hatred, violence. This is hell. This place is hell on earth. This is a filthy, sick world we live in. If man treats another man like that, he just chuck him out for money. Just leave him to die. And I lay there and I almost felt like giving up, you know, honestly, I almost thought, what's the point in even trying to get to hospital? If your number's up, psh, let it go, just die. And yet I remember my grandfather went through the First World War and gassed in the Second World War and he'd been in Gallipoli, he'd been in the Somme. <laughs> and he had, he had, I remember before he died, he had talked to me and he said, you know, go to the last breath, hang in there. You know, we're a Scottish background, so pretty stubborn. He's hanging. <laughs> Don't give up. And so I thought, well, I've got a good arm. Still, I think that's still working. So I tried to drag myself towards the, host towards the hotel entrance because it was just outside the gate there. And I could see some lights on, so I was trying to get so someone would see me. And to my amazement, the security guards who were doing the rounds with their lights and spotted me in the dirt groveling along. And a um, guy came running over, and I looked up to recognize him to be one of my drinking friends. <laughs> the big black guy called Danielle, or Daniel. Huge, lovable man. I used to drink with him just up at the shop. We used to have, you know, and after work, we used to sit with him and talk and, you know, enjoy his fellowship. And here he came, <laughs> runs up, sees me on the ground. He says, what's wrong with you? You're drunk? You're stoned? What's wrong with you? You know? And I, and I pulled up my my um, sweatshirt to show him my arm and he could see all the blisters and the sw swollenness and he went invisible because he'd seen other divers being stung by it and I went we oui, invisible and he went pas bon uh, <laughs> just grabbed me he didn't speak anymore he just scooped me up in his arm he's a massive man and ran it's like having a huge angel pick me up boy <laughs> pick me up and just ran in and he ran past the swimming pool come up to where the bar was and drop me in a cane chair about f 10 feet away from this Chinaman that owned the hotels. And they were playing poker or mahjong, I can't remember what it was, and drinking. And all the tourists had gone to bed. The bar was closed, so they were just having a beer, whatever it was, and some gambling after they'd all gone to bed. And he dropped me there and disappeared into the darkness again. And I'm almost expecting him to explain, but he didn't. He took off. And then I realized a black man cannot speak to a Chinese man in those countries unless he is asked to speak. The pecking order is white, Chinese, Indian, black. That's how it goes. And if you don't know that social order, you don't know what's going on. And so they just, he dropped me there and I realized I'm going to have to try and communicate with these Chinese guys that I needed help. So I tried to pulled my arm up and showed them my swollen and blistered arm 
and said, I need quatre bon in, in immediately. I even knew some Chinese. <laughs> so I spoke what I knew to get him to help me. And, and, the, and they just laughed. One of the young boys got up, one of the young Chinese got up and said, Oh, white boy, <laughs> heroin no good for you. Only old men, we take the opium. Only old men, because uh, he thought I was on drugs, an overdose or something, because I showed him my arm and it looked like injections. But it wasn't from, his, from that distance. And he's trying to tell me that I was on drugs. And in me, I was getting, I was getting furious and frustrated. And as I sat there, trying to keep my calm, because if I get too excited, the poison moves quicker, <laughs> And my whole body, every, every muscle in my body started to twitch and contract. I don't have any nurses around here, but it was literally going in muscular contractions over every single part of my body. Poison was just hitting me. And I literally was leaving the seat as the poison was reacting with my muscles. And they came running over and tried, three men tried to hold me down. They couldn't. I was just chucking them off. And then I came out of this incredible shaking and deadly cold crept over my bone marrow. I could see like a, like a darkness creeping over the inner part of my bone. And it was like death was creeping over me. And I, I knew it. I knew my body was just dying right in front of me. And it was incredibly cold, incredibly cold. I was just shivering. And then they started putting blankets all over me and trying to just keep me warm. And I'm sitting there still trying to keep it together and I'm asking them, take me to the hospital please I could see their car was out there and he just come up the Chinese come up and put his hand on my shoulder and said no nah, we we'll wait for ambulance white boy <laughs> and the Chinese hate the whites so much hatred and so I sat there going I don't think I'm ever going to get there and just as I'm about thinking that in my mind the ambulance arrives and out of nowhere, Danielle arrives with one of his other security mates, puts me, <coughs> slings me over their arms and takes off. And I realise now that he hadn't even wasted his time with these idiots. He had gone straight to the <laughs> switchboard. And his girlfriend actually was on the switchboard. And he had run the hospital himself. <laughs> and so the ambulance had arrived, came screaming in with his headlights, did a U-turn in front of the hotel and just took off. Now, if you've ever known a French driver, has anyone known anything about French people? Oh, those crazy drivers in the world, impatient. <laughs> and this is a French guy, and it was a black hospital. The ambulance driver was French, and he obviously thought the black guys were drunk or something and false alarm, and no one out there in front of the hotel took off. So here I am halfway to the gate and see the ambulance going around the corner. And I'm going... <sighs> I could whistle on the farm, but I'm... When you're dehydrated, you can't whistle. And Daniel heard me trying to whistle. And he just wolf whistles one out. <laughs> Ricochets off the wall and down the road. And I think the ambulance guy must have had his window down because he got a full blast. Brake lights went on, backs up. And all it is is a Renault 4 with the front seat taken out. <laughs> this is the black ambulance. A Renault 4, front seat ripped out, and a camp stretcher put there. That's it, boys. That's the ambulance. <laughs> Anyhow, I wasn't worried. I didn't care what took me there. And I, he just didn't even get out of the ambulance. He just leaned over, opened the door where he sat as a driver. They dropped me in, <laughs> fell back into the cam stretcher, closed the door, <laughs> off. Not, how's your mother? How are you? <laughs> you want a blanket? What's wrong with you? He's the driver. Off he goes. Oh, I'm just shivering, shaking on, and what on earth's going on? trying to keep, keep myself together, trying not to close my eyes, and knowing that I've got to stay awake till I get some antitoxins. <laughs> Halfway up to the hospital, we're climbing the hill, and I'm going, that's the worst thing. <laughs> I'm going climbing the hill with my feet going up the air. Every poison in my blood is just going to start rushing straight to the brain. It's going to kill me. If anything, they should have had me planted the other way. <laughs> And I'm struggling. I could feel the poison starting to rush to my head. It was incredible. And as I was, as I was literally in that place, I start seeing a picture of a little snowy-headed boy, about so big. And I, it's so clear. And then I see another flash of an older boy with snowy white hair. And I'm looking, going, gee, he's got white hair. And then, but older. 
And suddenly I realise I'm looking at myself. I'm seeing my life <laughs> go before me. And it's a frightening experience. Kept parts of your life just going before you like a video, clear as crystal, my eyes, eyes wide open, totally conscious of what's going on. And, and I look and I'm going, I've heard about this and I've even read about it. People say just before they die, they see their life go before them. And so I saw it and in my heart, oh, I was scared. I went, I'm too young to die. Why did I go diving for you, idiot? You should have stayed at home. You should never have gone diving. Sorry, too late. I'm th racing through <laughs> all the thoughts, like, why, did, why didn't you just stay at home, you idiot? Why didn't you just stay at home? But now this, I'm confronted with potential death. And I knew that I was very close to it from all the reactions of my body. I must be very, very close to dying. I could hardly feel hear my heart breathe, you know, my, my lungs breathe, and I could hardly hear my heart beating. It was so quiet and so soft. And as I lay there, I'm going, what happens if I die? Is there anything? <laughs> Is there anything happening if I, after I die? Where do I go if I do die? And then I saw a vision of my mother, clear as crystal, standing there in my vision. And it's as though she's speaking out words. Ian, no matter how far from God you are, no matter what you've done wrong, if you cry out to God from your heart, he will hear you and he will forgive you. And in my heart I said, do I believe there's a God? Am I going to pray? I'd almost been become a devout atheist at that stage. <laughs> I don't believe anybody. And yet, I was confronted with a vision of my mum. I talked to my mum after this when I got back to New Zealand and she had been woken up in the early hours of the morning with a dream of me in an ambulance nearly dead and had started praying for me. So a woman that mums and dads that pray don't stop praying. <laughs> God wakes you up, you start praying. Because her prayers break through right there. Now of course her prayers can't save my life. She can't get me to heaven. But I knew that I needed to pray. And I needed to pray from my heart. And I thought, well, what do I pray? Who do I pray to? Which God? What is it, Buddha, Gani, Shiva? <coughs> Which God? There's thousands of them. I've seen them all. And yet, I didn't see Buddha or Krishna or some other God or man standing there. I saw my mum. And my mum follows Jesus Christ, Christian God. And I went, and I've seen all the religions, I've studied them, been there, and yet mum's a follower of Christ. And I went, well, I haven't prayed for years. And I tried, what do I pray? How, what do you pray at this point? What's the prayer if you're about to die? What do you pray? And I can remember as a child, my mother always teaching us the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as I thought, well, I'll pray that. That's the only prayer I know that's Christian. And so I tried to pray it. But it was a, from, from my memory. But I couldn't remember it. It was as though the poison that had rushed to my head had almost stopped me able to think. <laughs> it was closing my mind down. It was a frightening experience. I'd relied so much on my mind... <laughs> and my intellect, and suddenly it's dying on me. Mental blank, zero. And I'd use a lot of reliance upon this, believe me. <laughs> a lot, too much. And I'm lying there, realizing that the prayers, it's not up here. And mum said, pray from your heart. So I said, God, I don't know where this prayer is. I want to pray it. Help me. And as I said that, part of the prayer literally came like from my inner man, from my spirit, and the first part of the prayer said, Thy will be done. No, sorry, but it wasn't exactly. It was, forgive us our sins. That's right, I want to get it exact. Forgive us our sins. And I went, Phew. God, I ask you to forgive my sins, but I have done so many things wrong. I know they're wrong. My conscience tells me they're wrong. If you can forgive me all my sins, and I don't know how you can do it, I've got no idea how you can forgive them, please forgive me of my sins. And I meant it. I wanted to just wipe the slate clean, start again. 
God forgive me. And as I got that, I got another part of the prayer. Forgive those who have sinned against you. And I understood that to mean to forgive those that had hurt me. And I went, well, I don't hold grudges. There's heaps of people that have ripped me off and backstabbed me and said bad things against me and done terrible things to me. I forgive them. And I heard the voice of God say, will you forgive the Indian that pushed you out of the car and the Chinese that wouldn't take you to the hospital? And I went, hmm. <laughs> I had other plans. <laughs> But I've come through this, and I went, okay, I'll forgive them. If you can forgive me, okay, I can forgive them. I'll forgive them. And the next part of the prayer was, my will be, thy will be done. And I understood that I've done my own thing for the last 20 odd years, 25 years. And I said, God, if I come through this, I don't even know what your will is. I've got no idea what your will is. I know it's not to do evil things, but I've got no idea what your will is. If I come through this, I will find out your will for my life, and I'll do it. I'll make a point of following you wholeheartedly if I come through this. And then I got all the rest of the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy, you know, got the whole of the Lord's Prayer, but those three things stood out very, very clearly. I didn't realize it, but that's basically a salvation prayer. That's basically a broken, repentant heart. Not from your head, <laughs> but from my heart saying, God, forgive me for my wickedness and evil. God, cleanse me. Lord, I forgive all those that have hurt me. And Jesus Christ, Lord, come and I'll do your will. Thy will be done. I will follow you. I didn't realize that at the time, but reflecting on it, I prayed the sinner's prayer, the repentant prayer to the Lord. And I felt an incredible peace come over my heart as I prayed the Lord's prayer. And it seemed as though the fear just left me, the fear of what was coming. I felt a real peace in my heart. I was still dying. <laughs> I knew that, but I at least was at peace about it. I'd made my peace with my maker. I knew it. I knew for the first time I'd touched God, and I knew I was actually hearing him for the first time. I'd never heard him before. <laughs> and I was hearing him speaking to me. No one else could have told me the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and, and I got into the, into the hospital, they put me in a wheelchair and ran me through, took my blood pressure, pumped it up, and I, could, I was sitting there watching the nurse looking at the gauge, and she hit it. <laughs> what kind of hospital is this? <laughs> in my heart. It was an old World War II Army hospital, British deserted and given into the app to the black guys. It still looked like it was built in 1945 too. It was filthy, old, old equipment, and yet here I was, and she hit it, and, I'm, and in my heart I'm going, there's nothing wrong with your machine. Me, it's my heart, it's not pumping. She rips it off, pulls another one, looks through the cupboard, tries to find another one that looks new, pulls that out, slaps it on, lifts it, opens it up, starts pumping. And I can see that, you know, whatever it's doing is not registering very much. And she's still looking at me, looking at the machines. My eyes are open. But she's basically wondering, with this kind of blood pressure, your eyes shouldn't be open. And I knew that. I was desperately hanging on. I was just kind of hanging on for all, all I was worth. I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to stay in this body. I didn't want to die. I was fighting with all my strength to stay alive. Came th and so she ripped it off and ran me through to the, ran me through to the doctors. And now all it was was just a railing with a like a shower curtain. <laughs> Pull that apart, and here's a couple of benches, and here's the two Indian doctors sitting there, both of them h half asleep, head down. Young boys, young doctors going, what's your name? Where do you live? In French. <laughs> How old are you? Collage <laughs> teal. And I can understand. I'm young. Oh, he hasn't even looked at me. And I, he's a young guy, and I looked over to the old guy. He was going a bit bald, but grey here, and I thought, well, he's been around for a few years. He might know how to help me. So I waited. The young boy stopped talking, looked up. I didn't even bother looking at him, and waited for the old man to lift his head up. He looked up, and I thought, I hope I've got enough strength to speak. Because I'm paralysed. I don't know whether I can speak. And I locked into his eyes, and I gave him 
the heaviest look I could muster up. And I went, I am about to die. I need antitoxins right now. And as he didn't move, I didn't take my eyes off him. And he was just staring straight back in. The nurse came in with the piece of paper. And he looked at it, looked at me, and jumped. I could see him screw it, just like, you foolish idiot, why don't you look at this young boy? Jump, push the ambulance driver out of the way, himself grab it, and start racing me down the wheelchair, screaming out something behind me. I could hear a kind of muffled noise of him. I could hear his scream, but it didn't sound like it. It was muffled to me. And he run in, run into this room, and with bottles and stuff, next minute I'm surrounded by nurses and doctors and orderlies and I'm kind of sitting there at long last <laughs> at long last boy something has happened and one nurse has turned my arm over drip feed I'm just sitting there watching the doctor's up near my face and don't worry keep him keep away keep away it's all right we're putting dextrose in for dehydration and another nurse jabbing needle in here here another nurse over the side jabbing I can't feel him but I'm seeing them do it he's going antitoxins to counteract the poison and he's speaking his English, <laughs> basically trained in Oxford or something. <laughs> and another nurse down here, knelt by my feet, doing this as hard as she can, slapping my hand. And I'm, what is she doing? I don't care, shove them all in. <laughs> nurse behind with a, like, I've been on the farm, we've put, we've put horse syringes into these cows. Here's this nurse full enough, something like a syringe this big with stuff right behind her and squeezing the ear out of it. Couple passes it to the nurse, ram, lifts, she tries to, nothing happened, no vein came up. I realised what she was doing after. No vein came up. So she lifted my skin up and dropped the needle, pushed the needle in, tried to find the vein. Started pushing the, the stuff in and it just filled up my vein like my small finger, it just blew up like a balloon. And I could see how nervous she was because the needle was inside the vein and it looked like it was moving, it was just going to tear it open. I'm going, be, in my heart, I'm going, be careful, you know. And the doctor's saying, don't worry, don't worry. And so she leaves the needle piece in, another nurse passes her another one, slams another one in, comes up to here, just blows the vein up. And, and the nurse looks at the doctor and goes, another one? The doctor nods and goes, another one. Whew, comes up to here. And she pulls the needle out, and this other nurse that had just given me antitoxins now trying to massage it in, but it's rolling, the vein's actually rolling off her thumb. She can't actually get it into the blood, it's just rolling off. It's like, it's not moving. And I'm going, my heart obviously is not pumping around enough for my blood to be moving. My veins are collapsing. See, I'd done veterinary science, my degree. I'd studied and understood basic physiology and <laughs> anatomy. I understood what was going on, but I couldn't do anything about it. I just understood that I was close to co I was slipping into comoid state, totally paralysed, and my heart was literally moving into a point where it's not working anymore. I had no idea that what I'd been stung by, which the natives called invisabla, which is called by most, there's a scientific name by it, but it's actually called a box jellyfish or a sea wasp. It's the second deadliest venom known to man. One sting has killed up to 60 people in Darwin alone over the last 20 years. They put skull and crossbones on the beaches for six months of the year and prevent bathers from going in to the water in Darwin to swim. And I hadn't had all this knowledge. I found this out after when I got out of the hospital. I had enough toxin in me to kill me five times over. And normally the person dies within 15 minutes of the initial sting. I didn't have it just on a muscle. I had it right across my veins right in, intravenous almost. So I had enough toxin in there. It's the second deadliest venom known to man. The first is called a Pacific Blue Ringed Octopus. And people have died from it, but they're the, that's the most deadly venom. Down to the box jellyfish and then the snake family and the spider family. And so I'm lying there, sitting there in this wheelchair, and the doctor's still looking me in the eye and saying, don't be afraid. And in his eyes I see paranoia and fear. And I said, mate, you are more afraid than me. <laughs> you give a lot of confidence. You know, I'm... And I'm in my heart. I wish I... I tried to speak, but I didn't seem to be able to. I was going, have you got any more? Maybe I'm immune to your drugs. Maybe I've taken too much, you know, too much booze or, or dope over the years that I'm immune to it. <laughs> Anyhow, they lifted me up, put me in a, in a bed with my drip feed and lay there. 
and he, the doctor stood over me sponging my head and to say the drip feed they put in was bringing the, all the liquid back into my body and I was starting to have perspiration come back to my forehead and he was keeping it from my head and then he walked off for a few minutes and as I lay there I could feel it dripping into my eyes and starting to blur my vision it's like tears coming into my eyes and in my heart I'm going you know I, I've got to keep my eyes open doctor <laughs> come back and wipe my head and, and he didn't seem to be coming back so I try to speak I went doctor come back and no movement my lips would not move and then I'm frantically going well do that my arms wouldn't move I was getting freaked out tilt your head so at least you can see out one eye my head wouldn't move where's that doctor Use your eye, let's flick one eye, unless you can squeeze the liquid out and see with one eye. Oh, got a little bit out, but it's still blurry. Try both eyes and squeeze it. And I kept doing it, and it seemed like it was a bit of success, and then all of a sudden, it's as though... And I sighed, like a sigh of relief went... And I knew, I just... The, something had happened I knew there was a release or a, the battle was over the battle for staying alive seemed to be over no one, no one told me what had happened to me no one said you just died son I didn't know that all I knew was that the battle for trying to keep my eyes open and stay alive was over and I knew it, I'd gone somewhere it wasn't just like closing your eyes and going to sleep. I knew I'd gone somewhere. And I'd been having the floating away feeling for the last, seemed like the last 20 minutes. <laughs> but I'd been hanging on to this body with everything. I wasn't going to float away nowhere. I didn't want to float away anywhere. And yet when I closed my eyes, it wasn't just floating. I was just gone. The Bible says that when a man dies, in Ecclesiastes, King Solomon actually wrote this, Ecclesiastes that when a man dies, the spirit returns to God who gave it, and the, and the dust returns to dust, you know, <laughs> body returns to dust from where it came from. Well, I knew I, my spirit had left. I had gone somewhere, and yet I didn't know I was dead. But I seemed to arrive in a broad, in a huge place, like a void of pitch darkness. And I felt like I was standing up, and it's like I'd woken up, from a bad dream in someone's house, someone else's house, not my own house, and gone, where's everyone gone? Who turned the lights off? And looking around, trying to orientate myself to this new surrounding, trying to look for, for you know, something that would make out to be real. And so I went, you know, you look, when you're in the middle of the night, you're trying to, have it woken up and try to find the light switch? <laughs> well, I'm trying to find the light switch, and I can't seem to find it. I'm trying to touch something, and I'm moving, and there's nothing there. And I'm not even bumping into anything. So I'm going, I can't even see my hand in front of my face. So I lift my hand up to, <laughs> to find out how much I can see. And I go to where my face is. I went, I missed my face. No. Where is it? <laughs> That's a frightening experience. Where's my hand? Where's my... And I knew, right then and then, I was me, Ian McCormick, standing, but no body. I had the sensation and the feeling that I had a body, but I had no, nothing physical to touch. And it's the most frightening experience to know that you, who you are really inside, are really a spirit. <laughs> that you really are a spirit. You're a spirit being. God said, I am a spirit. I have created you in my image. God is a spirit. It's a spiritual being, an invisible spiritual being. And we're created in his image. And I'm suddenly realizing <laughs> that I'm a spiritual being. And, my, and I... 
My physical body died, but I am very much alive and very much aware that I have got what used to be arms and legs and head, but I no longer can touch them. And I'm going, in my heart, where on earth am I? And as I'm standing there in the darkness looking around, I sense the most incredible coldness and fear coming over my spirit. I don't know whether you've ever felt that. You walked in... Maybe you walk down, you know, walk down a lonely street at night or you're coming home by yourself and you just feel as though there's someone looking at you. You ever felt that? That you, you sense someone's looking at you in the darkness, but you can't see them. You'll look, but your spirit will be threatened. You might be in the home alone and there's something in the house and you know there's something there, but you can't see it, but boy, you can feel it. Sometimes you can even hear it. Well, I knew there was something around me and I became more aware that there were, it seemed like, other people moving around me in the same predicament as me. And yet I was picking up literally, shut up, son. Don't move. Don't disturb our peace. Shut up. You deserve to be here. I was hearing different impressions like voices speaking around me in this darkness. And I'm going, where on earth am I? <laughs> it feels like hell. And I'm just, you know, like, don't move, don't breathe, don't speak, just... Psh. And I really, in that split second, went, this must be hell. This must be hell. Where on earth, what's going on? And I, in my heart, I was terrified. People have this picture of hell, of party time and great enjoyment. Trash. I used to think that too. You can do all the things that you're not supposed to do, you're not allowed to do, and go and do them. God's not fun. He just wants you to be miserable. Trash. Absolute trash. That place is the most frightening place. They cannot do anything that their wicked hearts want to do. They can't do anything. And there's no boasting. Who can you tell down there? Oh, yeah, I raped, murdered, plundered, pillaged. I did this. Well, whoop de doo boy. <laughs> so I did this, this, and this. They soon realize there's nothing down there to talk about. Nothing. And they know that judgment's coming. There's no relationship to time. They can't tell <laughs> what time it is. They can't tell whether they've been down there 10 minutes, 10 years, 10,000 years. Why? You've got no relationship to time. It is a frightening place. The Bible says that there are two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness, who's ruled by Satan, and the kingdom of light. Jude tells us that that place was actually prepared for angels that disobeyed God, not for man, not for men, ever. It was placed for disobedient angels, never for man. And it is the most scary and the most frightening and the most terrifying place I've ever been in. And I have no, even the worst enemy, I'd never wish or hope that they went to hell. Because if they knew where they were going, they would never, ever, ever want to go there. And I was realized I was there. And I had no idea, how do you ever get out of hell? But I'd already prayed. And I was kind of wondering why on earth I'd gone there. Because I'd pray just before I died. I said, God, forgive me of my sins. And as I'm crying, I literally cried out to God saying, God, why am I here? I've, I've asked you forgiveness. Why am I here? I've turned my heart to you. Why am I here? And a brilliant light shone upon me and literally drew me out of the darkness. The Bible says that, that light has shone into darkness. Those walking in, in the shadow of death and darkness, a great light has, has shone upon them and guided, and guided their feet into the paths of peace and righteousness. That those walking in darkness have seen a great light. And I saw this incredible light and I was literally taken up into the presence of this light, just drawn up. And so, well, I was so... <laughs> happy in my heart that I was leaving this pit of darkness but the only way I could leave 
is because I'd repented before I died. You can't repent when you get down there. You can only repent before you die. You can't pray your way out of heaven, out of hell, and no one on earth can pray you out of hell. No one. No one. You have to have prayed yourself. The Bible teaches that. No one can pray for dead, departed souls and get them out of hell if they had never repented. They have had to have repented. I say that because I believe that what God wanted me to share that. I went up into what looked like an opening or a passageway, a narrow passageway. Narrow is the road that leads to the kingdom of God. Few are those who find it. Many find the broad road that leads to destruction. And I found a narrow passageway that led through. I was taken up into that, and I looked to the end of that passageway or tunnel, and I could see the source of the universe. It looked literally like the source of all power, of all light, the center of the universe, more brilliant than the sun, more radiant than any jewel, any diamond, even more radiant and more incredible than a laser beam light. Credible intensity. And yet you could look right into it. And as I looked, I was drawn, and literally like drawn like a moth into the presence of a fire, literally just drawn into that light. And as I was drawn towards that light, waves of light started coming off, emanating off the source. And the first wave that hit me was total comfort and warmth. And I got a sigh of relief in my spirit. Came closer down the tunnel, and a wave of intense light seemed to come up the tunnel towards me, hit me total peace from head to toe and I was at school had read poetry from Keats to Shakespeare to you name it to try and get peace of mind I had tried alcohol I had tried education I had tried sport I had tried relationships with women I had tried drugs I tried everything to find peace in my life and I'd never found it if I had it it was gl glimpses <laughs> fleeting seconds or fleeting minutes, sometimes fleeting hours, if you're really lucky, of peace and contentment. And yet I had total and complete peace. And in my heart I went, this is incredible. This light, this pure white light, has got emotion coming off. It's a, I can feel <laughs> peace. I can feel it. And I got, as I was getting closer, I went, I'm in the light, I wonder what I, if, what I look like. I couldn't even see, I couldn't even see my body down there in the darkness. Maybe I can see what I look like. So I looked, and I saw an arm of light. <sighs> oh, was, you know, it was freaky, to tell you the truth, but it was the same light that was coming off the source down there. I was literally a form of light. I looked back, drawn closer into the light, and a wave of joy. Who knows what it is to be joyful? <laughs> I had incredible joy well up within me, and excitement. Who gets excited? No. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm, wherever I'm going, this is fantastic. My mind couldn't even conceive where I was going. And well, my words can't even communicate what I saw, I'm telling you. <laughs> I can see it as I'm sharing it, but I don't know how I can communicate with you. Came out of the end of the tunnel and seemed to be standing upright before the, literally the source of all light and power. And my whole of my eyesight was taken up with this incredible light. Words that came to, thoughts that came to my mind were aura. <laughs> okay, I wasn't a Christian at that point, you know, <laughs> I didn't, and the next one that came was glory, this is just glorious, <laughs> you know they have um, pictures of Jesus with a little wee tiny halo or little glow around his face, you ever seen paintings like that, Picasso or whoever else has done them, you know, little, glo little glows, <laughs> Jesus Christ when he died, he rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven, seated upon the right hand of the Father of, on high, and is glorified, surrounded by unapproachable light, glorified, the King of, King of glory, <laughs> the Prince of peace, the Lord of lords, the King of all the kings, <laughs> glorified. And I saw what I believe was the glory 
of the Lord. You see, on the Old Testament, I've just been reading, Moses went up onto the mountain Sinai for 40 days, and he saw the glory of the Lord. He came down and his face shone. <laughs> Moses' face shone with the glory of the Lord, and he had to put a veil, otherwise the people get scared. He had seen the light of God, the glory of God. Paul was blinded by a blinding light on the road to Damascus. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I saw incredible light and glory. And I stood there and in my heart I went, question in my heart, is this just a force, which the Buddhists say, or the Hindus, the force be with you, <laughs> okay, or karma or whatever, yin and yang, is this just a force or is this truly a person living in there, standing in there? See, I'm still questioning a bit. Is there a person in there? And as I thought that in my heart, it's as though I instantly heard a reply. Ian, do you wish to return? Answering the first one, yes, there is a person in there. And the second one, do you want to go back? And I went, where on earth am I? <laughs> Look back, and there is a tunnel leading back into darkness. And I went, where am I? I thought I was in my hospital bed and just closed my eyes. I thought this was a bit of a dream. <laughs> Is this real? Am I actually standing here? Me, Ian, standing in real life here? Is this real? And the Lord spoke again, do you wish to return? And I went, I think so. I, I want to go back to where I was. I want to go back. I don't know where I am. Just send me home. <laughs> go back to the hospital bed. And then he spoke and said, if you wish to return, you must see in a new light. The moment I heard the words, see, in a new light, something clicked. And I'd remembered being given a scripture that said, Jesus is the light of the world. And another scripture in 1 John 1, 5, saying, God is light and there is no darkness in him. And I'd meditated upon those. A Christmas. Someone give me a Christmas card with those scriptures. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. God is light. There is no darkness in him. And I just come from darkness, and there's sure no darkness in <laughs> here. And this is God. There is, he is light. And I suddenly thought, you must be God. What am I doing, a filthy young sinner, <laughs> young kid, standing in front of you? How can I stand in your presence? I suddenly got realized that he could see everything. My life was an open book. You can't hide anything. I'm, I suddenly realized that I must be transparent because everything I thought he could understand. I wasn't speaking to him. I was just feeling it, thinking it. And he could understand. And I went, he can see exactly what's going on, what has happened. I wanted to literally back off and find some rock and crawl under it. I wanted to get away from his presence. And as I was about to back away, waves of light hit me. Waves and waves and waves. And guess what they were? Pure, unadulterated, clean, <laughs> uninhibited, undeserved love. <laughs> and I just lapped. Oh, well, I just... <laughs> I could feel love. Who's felt loved? You ever feel loved? <laughs> I hadn't felt love for years. <laughs> the last time I remember being loved was my mum and dad, you know, when I was at home. But I'd gone out into the big wide world and found out there's not too much love out there. <laughs> and I hadn't seen much love. I'd seen thought, things that I thought were love, sex, and that wasn't love. They just burnt you up. <laughs> it was just a raging fire inside you, uncontrollable passion and desire. It just burnt you up from the inside out. I'd never known pure love really, and it was incredible love came upon me. And I was going, I don't deserve it. You know, look at me, you know my life. <laughs> I don't deserve being loved. And I got more <laughs> until I shut up. <laughs> and I got loved, just waves and waves of love. And I just recovered from all that and went, I wonder if I can s see you. <laughs> if you can love me, boy, oh, I'd love to see who you are. <laughs> If I could see you face to face, I will know the truth. Who wants to know the truth? 
I want to know the truth. I'm sick of hearing lies and deceptions and bull. I'm sick of it. I wanted to know the truth. I had been everywhere to find the truth, and no one seemed to be able to tell me. <laughs> I'd talk to anybody who could tell me the meaning to life, the truth, what was going on, what was really the truth. Something had to be the truth. And I thought, if I could step through and meet you face to face, I'll know the truth, and I'll know the meaning to life. I will never have to ask another man, woman, or child ever again. I'll know. Can I? No voice saying you can't. So I stepped through, put my best foot forward and stepped through the light. And as I was stepping through, I could start to make out a man was standing there. And I broke through the light and in the center of it was a man standing with bare feet and white, dazzling white robes. And literally, I just lifted my head. As I lifted, I could see that round his face was like intense, intense radiance. I think Revelations is the closest. talks about eyes of fire, flames of fire. But the face was radiant. So radiant that you couldn't make out the physical features. It was so intense. But you could see the form of a man. And I'm almost trying to get close enough to see the face. Who wanted to do that? <laughs> I always just say, if I could see God, I'd believe. Well, I was seeing him, and I was believing. And as I'm trying to penetrate to see his face, he steps aside. Literally, steps to one side. And all the light and glory that around him moves with him, of course. And directly behind him is the same shape of a tunnel and like transparent glass in front of me. And I'm standing there looking out upon a brand new planet. Green grass. It's like a new world opening up before me. And I'm soaking it in. Blue skies. I see a river see mountains, hills, trees. Well, I've been looking for that. Makes New Zealand look a bit run down. It's got no dock and ragwort and noddies and <laughs> barbed wire fence and <laughs> the old herringbone stuck on it, folks. <laughs> and I'm just taking it all in. And everything in me is going, this is, this is where I, this is home. <laughs> I've been traveling the world looking for this. This is home. This is where I belong. This is paradise. <laughs> and everything in me wanted to just leap through. I think if I had stepped through, if I stepped on the grass, it would almost have sprung back into place. The same light and glory that was upon the Lord was upon his creation. I've read since in Second Peter chapter 3 that, that the Lord said, this earth will be judged and destroyed the second time, first time was by the flood, the second judgment, the final judgment will be with fire. And the Lord is, what has he made? A new earth and a new heaven for those who love him. Whew. He thinks this world's polluted, sick and dying. Come to India, folks. Come to the rest of the real world. New Zealand is heaven on earth. Just close. If you want to know heaven, what heaven looks like, look out this window right now. And you've got a pretty good idea what it looks like. That's why most New Zealanders find it difficult to understand hell and heaven. Because they're living closest to heaven you can get on this planet. And I've traveled many, many countries. Well, I was looking at something better than New Zealand. Perfect. And in my heart, I just wanted to step through and stay. Forget coming home. And as I'm about to literally move, the Lord steps before me. The Bible says that Jesus is the door. That if you come through him, you will go in and out and find green pastures. He is the door to life. John chapter 10, John chapter 14 says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes. He is the only way. There's only one narrow passageway to lead into his kingdom. 
few find it. Most find the expressway or the, <laughs> the highway down to hell. But I come to the door. And the Lord stood in front of me again and said, Ian, choose. Do you wish to return now? That was hard. What's there to return for, Lord? <laughs> What's back here? Misery? Potentially a third world war to me looked like coming up. It was going to end all wars. It was hell on earth. <laughs> Miserable, hatred, hurting people. Didn't have to go to hell to find out about hell. Just hang around earth long enough and you'd, you'd, you'd get it. <laughs> He'll get it. And as I'm thinking that, I'm not married, no kids, no ties. I've experienced all that this world could offer, that I thought anyhow. And it was all psh, nothing, dust, nothing. No peace, no fulfillment, no real satisfaction, really. And I went, almost in my heart, I'm just, I'm going through. Forget coming back here. And then, like as a last thought, I turned my shoulder, turned over my shoulder, almost to reflect on goodbye, <laughs> you know. And as I looked back, I saw a vision of my mother standing a few feet away from me, and I just sh stopped me in my tracks. And I went, "That's the only person that I'm really going to miss on this earth. That's the only person that really is close, and I've known the love, true love from." and acceptance and she is a lovely gentle woman and I went if I go through and she has to bury another member of her family her eldest son it could cripple her faith in God and it could destroy her and I went if I went through, it would just be selfishness, the fact that I'd go through and enjoy paradise and heaven, and my mother would think that I'd gone to hell, knowing that I was not walking with the Lord, and knowing that I had no faith in Him. And she would have no idea that I'd had a deathbed prayer and repented of my sins and received Him as my Lord and Saviour. She would have had no idea that I was going to heaven or I'd even got there. She would have just got a dead body in a box from Mauritius. And I went, God, there's only one person really I want to go back for is my mum. And tell her that what she believes in is true. That there is a living God. That there is a heaven and a hell. That there is a door and Jesus Christ is that door standing there. That we can only come through him. And as I look back again, I saw behind them my father, my, my brothers and sister, my brother and sister, my friends. And then like a multitude of people behind them. And I said, and in my heart I realized that God was showing me that there's a lot of other people that don't know also and will never know unless I was able to share with them. And I went, God, I want to go back and tell them all. And I said, I've come here once. I don't even really know how I got here, but I can certainly find out and I am coming back again. If I've come here once, I know I can come back here again. And I'm going to make sure I come back. You believe that I'm going to go back there? Yeah. I am. I don't really, if none of you believe what I've shared and none of you choose to follow the Lord, I will still follow Jesus Christ. I am still going back to that door and I'm going to enter into paradise. Hallelujah. I am not going into the pits of hell. And I share with you because I wish none of you to go. <laughs> And the Lord wishes none of you to go. If he can love me, <laughs> the things I've done wrong, he can love any, any person. I'm sure we all feel that way. Okay. And I said, God, how do I return? Through this tunnel, darkness, back into my body? How can I go back? I don't even know how I got here. And I, the Lord said, if you return, you must see things in a new light. And I understood that I must see through his eyes. Who would like to see through the eyes of Jesus? Who would like to see through the eyes of pure love, pure peace, total forgiveness, total, complete comfort and joy? 
Oh, I pray that. I say, Jesus, I want to have your eyes. <laughs> I want to look through your eyes of love. I want to see this world as you see it, through the eyes of eternity. Stamp eternity in my eyes. I want to go there. I want to bring the presence of God here on earth, the love of God here on earth. And I say, God, how do I go back? I don't know how to go back. I found the Lord just speak, he said. Ian, tilt your head. Now feel the liquid drain from your eyes. Now open your eye and see. Now I had one eye open. And that the doctors were about to wheel me off to the morgue. <laughs> There's no reason why God should forgive me, but that he loves each one of us. And he wants everyone to know him and to come to that place of repentance. And to turn from our sin and evil way and come back to him and accept his love, accept his forgiveness in our life. There's no other way. And it's total commitment. If you give everything to the Lord, He will come in in His fullness in your life. Amen. Amen. I'd like us just to sing. There's one song that really the Lord laid in my heart this morning. And there was Jesus at your name. We bow the knee. I think it's a beautiful song. Philippians tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and, and I really believe that if that's in your heart to do that this morning, to bow your knee before the Lord, He will truly come into your life. So I'd like us just to sing this song. And, and if the Lord has touched you and you really do want to come right and clean before him and receive him then I invite you just to even if you want to kneel wherever you are just kneel and ask the Lord to, be, to make himself real to be your Lord and Savior Amen Can we sing this? <laughs>